بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين واشهد ان لا اله الا الله ولي المؤمنين واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى عليه الله وما غرد لكم ليو على الفانين وبعد thank you once again for joining alhamdulillah uh, we just turned the recording on so bismillah let's continue <laughs> so so you heard about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh you know after discussing what we mentioned last week now we're talking about how she met rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and their relationship together covering some components uh you know avoiding what is already there's a lot of information about and just highlighting some uh key things in their relationship together so the uh she heard about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's noble character so she made him an offer to do trade for her at a higher rate than the other traders that were working for her now the reason that she was willing to give him more is because his character his nobility the way that he was his trustworthiness and his truthfulness on a said to us that made him a more valuable asset in today's world whoever has the highest degree is going to make the most money just like in in today's world where people who have the highest degrees and the highest accolades are the ones that are seen as the most valuable asset to add to your company the one who has the most certifications the one who has the most workplace experience even though the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was young when he uh, got to know khadija radhiyallahu anha even though this was the case he uh, had heard of his noble character and his trustworthiness as a person so especially in trade where you're taking assets from one part of the land and sending it to a completely different one and trusting that person to come back to sell the 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 uh, merchandise to turn a profit to come back with more merchandise so that you can sell it and turn a profit via her business model she's like this is a person who would be an invaluable asset to add to the company this would be an invaluable employee to add to the business so she was willing to pay him even more in order to add uh, him to what it was that she was doing by way of trade so whenever she sent him to Shem uh you know he went and he sold all of the merchandise and he came back with what she had requested because you know uh, as we mentioned from her business model she was into exporting and she was into importing so whenever she uh, had finished the complete business transaction from him going to Shem selling coming back with the merchandise and then selling that she found that her profits had doubled so beyond this she got the testimony from her servant Maisara uh, who uh went with him are said to us that and this servant of Khadija she told him about his exemplary character and she told him about things that she had observed while they were together that was just completely different than anything he had ever seen before like for example one of the things that that uh had happened was as they were traveling in the fierce sun there was always a cloud over the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to uh keep them shaded and uh while they were in uh, uh Sham a monk observed that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had sat under a tree and that monk had said the only person who sits in the shade of that tree is a prophet so after telling uh Khadija radhiyallahu anha all of these things up with everything that she had heard and everything she that she had witnessed herself she extended the notion to him of marriage now we know in today's world in today's society that this is odd now, i want you to know that even back then in that society it was not the norm people were coming to Khadija radhiyallahu anha after her husband had died in order to marry her because of her status and her position in the community her position in that society so for uh for someone of that status even though the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself was also from noble lineage it's not like he was the most powerful or uh, amongst them it was his family that was powerful but he himself he uh prior to this he was just a herder of camels but because of his exemplary character and and that feature of him she decided to extend the notion of marriage to him after rejecting many other people before that and so he uh after he had received that uh you know extension from her then he went back and he consulted with his family he talked to his uncles about it so they were the ones that set up the the uh, marriage by going to her father and then they secured it the mahr or the dowry that they had paid uh for uh their marriage to be complete was 20 camels now depending on the breed of the camel you know depending on where it's from you know thoroughbred camels in today's world thoroughbred racing camels can go for up to like 1.5 uh, million dollars starting and uh you know if they're winners of races and things like this they can go for you know upwards of 30 million dollars more expensive than uh some of the most expensive cars in the world but the average cost of just uh, uh of a of a camel you know camel that facilitates different things is about the 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 uh cost of a, a mid-level vehicle you know we talking like lexus money we talking like 55k 
So if you were to juxtapose that, because you know, the camels that they had, is not like the camels that you might get today, and you know, Bismillah, uh, Akbar, uh, Aid Mubarak, uh, the camels that they had back in the day were work camels, camels that they would ride into war, camels that they would, uh, you, know, uh, you know, use to traverse the land, camels uh, that, would, uh, that they would use to work the land. So um, factoring all of those things in together, uh, the average cost of the camel being 55k each, that's roughly 1.1 million dollars in today's currency. And so that formal proposal was actually set up by the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hamza, Rajallahu Alaihi So one of the things that I want to know from the marriage, from their relationship together, is Khadija was very accommodating to him throughout their marriage. She was very, very accommodating. Um, and, and, and this is something that she was known to be like smart, to be shrewd, to be, uh, you know, very resolute and extremely intelligent uh, in, before Islam came. So now we're talking about her relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Keep in mind, they were, they were married for some 15 years before the ayat came from Alaq, before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met Jibreel, before the, the journey uh, or the, the message of Islam had even uh, taken off. That's 15 years. So... Uh, saying that to say, early in their marriage or throughout the course of these of this time, a lot of things had happened that uh, that, that the Prophet them, not only that he remembered and recalled, but that many of the Sahaba, the people who would eventually go on to become Muslim, that they were also aware of. For example, Zayd radiallahu the same Zayd that's mentioned in Surah Al-Ahzab, the same Zayd that the Prophet them, he loved him so much that he called him as his son, even though uh, he was his servant. Uh, that he was the Prophet Sallallahu servant because Khadija actually gifted Zayd to the Prophet Sallallahu when she saw how much she loved him and how much affection he had for him. And uh, that, you know, that uh, connection of, of, well, it's not really a father-son connection, but you know, that's how much the Prophet Sallallahu loved him, that he called him Zayd ibn Muhammad, even though he was not his uh, birth father, which was a big deal, especially for, for someone that was actually a slave that wasn't even of noble lineage or anything like that. That's how much Rasulullah had loved Zayd. She was the one that gifted it, a gifted Zayd to Nabi Allah And she did not just do it out of compulsion. She realized how much the Prophet loved Zayd, how much Zayd loved the Prophet Muhammad and she was the one that had uh, gone out of her way to do that. And we're gonna talk about this when we when we capture some of the light from her noble example, Rajallahu Anha, and, and some of these other examples too. She actually allowed for Ali ibn Abi Talib to live with them uh, and provided a place for him in her home while raising him as her own. So we know uh, the example of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We know the impact that he had on the Ummah and we know uh, the many characteristics that we take from him. And uh, a part of his development as a person was being and living with the noble example of Khadija. And despite having many servants, she, she was rich. She had an estate. She had a, a, a good business. She had uh, people at her uh, at her beck and call. She had employees. Despite having many service, uh, servants and despite being from nobility, you know, someone who comes from nobility, someone who uh, is raised in, in like a first class environment where, you know, you got your salad fork on one side and you got your son on the other side and, you know, you, you just uh, navigate the world in a completely different way. Uh, you know how whenever you go to five-star restaurants and five-star hotels, it's just a completely different atmosphere going to the balls and all this type of stuff. If that's the standard in today's society, I want you to know that the nobles of old also had their own customs and their own treatment that was very different than middle class uh, or, or even the lower socioeconomic statuses. In our mind's eye, it's very easy for us to just think that everybody's just the same from top to bottom. But no, very, very clearly, they had different uh, socioeconomic structures within the society, and the nobles were not like the, uh, you know, the quote-unquote middle class, and the middle class was not quote-unquote like the lower class or the, the uh, impoverished. And so even though she was from nobility, and even though she had service at her disposal, even though she was the CEO of a booming business, she made it a point to serve the Prophet them directly. She did not ask anybody else to do it. Or, for example, whenever the Prophet them would, oh, would take some time and go to Jabal nur and reflect in, in uh, you know, uh, this is a part of a much larger discussion, but he had a type of way that he would worship Allah, uh, you know, prior to the Wahi even coming down. Uh, she was the one that would actually send the provision to him so that he could be there. So another thing to, to actually extrapolate from this is she was accommodating enough to give him personal time to have this uh, ability to have this uh, type of reflection. 
So we know uh, when Revelation came, we know that she was the first to believe. But one of the things that I've observed, and, and maybe you've heard otherwise, but if not, then we can uh, reflect on this together either way, is that she was, uh, well, of course, she, we know that she was the first Muslima. That means that she went through everything that everybody else went through. But I also want you to understand, because especially those of you who are in the field of da'wah, or you have non-Muslim friends, uh, you know, you try to talk to them about Islam, or maybe you have coworkers or neighbors and things like this. You know, when aid comes, we try to do a little bit more to, uh, you know, uh, convey the message of Islam to people, because it's a, a special time of the year for us, right? She did not just come to Islam on some blind following. I was born into this. Well, I guess if you're my husband, I will, uh, I will follow you no matter what. This was not her reasoning and her rationale behind it. Besides the well-known hadith of the characteristics of the Prophet something that she pointed out as to why uh, there's no way that Allah would be humiliating him or that this would be anything other than a message from Rabbul Alameen. She used her collective understanding of him, alayhi salatu wasalam, and she used what she knew, what she knew about uh, different religions, what she knew about the customs of that time, what she knew about what her uh, servant had told her years ago, whenever uh, you know he first came into her employment. She used everything she knew to quickly deduce that he was indeed chosen to be the messenger of Allah. And because of that, she supported him. It was not just on some blind whim or, uh, you know, I love you so much, whatever you say, it must be true. No, because A and B, she used syllogistic understanding. She used algorithmic thought processes she, uh, uh, you know, shrewdly and very intelligently deduced that if A, A and B equals C, then surely A plus B plus C is turning out to be D, and there's no other explanation except that you're the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, we know that, uh, that she was an immense supporter to him uh, throughout this time, up until her death. And for every difficulty that he and the Muslims faced, she was right there too. And I think that's something very easy to overlook. The early part of Islam, uh, I mean, there really, it wasn't until the end of Islam that things, uh, you can even really use the word easy, but, uh, you know, early on, we know that the oppression and the uh, systematic persecution of the Muslims was, was very prevalent. People being killed, people being tortured, people being slaughtered, uh, all types of, 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 of torment. Khadija radiallahu she was right there in it. And she had a high status in the society, but when people were becoming Muslim, they would immediately get brought all the way down. And in order to not make the story too long, we'll just briefly talk about when Beni Hashim and Beni Abdul Muttalib had uh, actually boycotted the Muslims and refused to do business with them, and people from different uh, tribes had, had uh, actually taken their own people, and you know, the slaves, for example, when Bilal was tortured, or uh, different incident, uh, incidents that had happened to different Sahaba, uh, she was a part of that boycott as well, where they were not able to get the same goods, they were not able to get the same services. And you know, this was a huge hit for her because she had uh, you know, a crazy business going on. Now, I want you to think, because uh, we can only use this type of analogical deduction to really understand how much money Khadija Radilan had made. If the mahr of the Prophet was 20 camels, and according to the average cost of camels in today's world, uh, you know, decently bred camels, which we know, uh, you know, uh, from that family that the Prophet Sallallahu was from, you know, they were not just dealing with just some old, uh, you know, raggedy one hump camel that walks with a limp. No, they were dealing with some top tier camels. So even if we use the lowest estimation of what type of camels they had, not even uh, assuming that they were race camels or super fast or, you know, uh, rare breeds or, or uh, thoroughbreds or purebreds or anything like that, assuming that each camel costs $55,000, then the, uh, in, in uh, USD standard today in 2020, then uh, that means that the Mahid, the Prophet in them gave her was $1.1 million. $1.1 million USD. Now, if this is the case, uh, you know, I can't give you a Mahid that's, that's really going to, that's, that's like less than what you would expect, right? From her father, Khuwailid, he's, uh, Ibn Asad, he's not going to just take some old ragged, raggedy thing if he's worth... Uh, millions, if she's worth millions too, then we're not just going to take this uh, any old type of thing, right? So if you were to use the matter that the Prophet them gave uh, her to just even estimate her wealth, then you know that she herself was a billionaire. And if she wasn't, she became one whenever the Prophet them gave her the camels. But just assuming because of her business model, she probably was worth a lot of money. Uh, but the details of that is not is not really known. Saying that to say, when the boycott happened to the Muslims and she being the first Muslim, the first Muslima, uh, was also a part of that, you know that her business took a huge hit. 
But even though that was the case, she tried to use her assets, she tried to use her money, she tried to use her influence to bring as much relief to the Muslims as possible uh, during this boycott and during these difficult times. And it wasn't until the end of her life uh, that, that, you know, we really see how much the Prophet Sallallahu loved her. There's many ahadith, there's many narrations, we know quite a bit, uh, and it's pretty well uh, common knowledge about how much the Prophet Sallallahu loved Khadija radiallahu anha and her merits above the merits of, uh, of the other Muslimats of this ummah, which puts her in a completely different category of all the Muslimin of this ummah, as our mother, our first mother, radiallahu anha. When death came, it came via an illness during which the Prophet ﷺ stayed by her side and he watched her continuously get sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker until Allah took her soul. So he tried to comfort her even as her sickness was growing worse and, and he tried to stay with her as much as possible. Now the impact of, of, of losing her anha, on the Prophet ﷺ is well known, right? This is a part of what we know historically or in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ as the year of sorrow. But this loss was a loss to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who who had lost a great supporter to him, both before they even got married and then well into their marriage, and and uh, 15 years into their marriage, and then some uh, another 10 years uh, after uh, he received revelation before she died, radiallahu anha. So that's like 25 years they were together. Some people you meet today were uh, were were married for like 25 years, right? Uh, so. When you think about it in this context, you can see like very, very clearly that the, the relationship that they had, it was just really, really something unique. But just as she was something that, uh, someone who was close to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, throughout the course of his life and had built that impact, I want you to also remember, she also had a very strong relationship with Zayd because he was in the household. She also had a very strong relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib. She also had a very, very strong relationship with all of the Muslims because uh, whenever people were coming to Islam, or whenever the boycott was happening, who was the supporter? Who was there? Who was helping? It was her, radiallahu anha. So her loss impacted the Prophet them, but it also impacted the Ummah altogether. When he grieved Ali Sadatu Wasallam, we know that the Sahaba were also be grieved by her loss as well. And uh, she, more than a supporter, more than a, a spiritual or, or financial supporter, she was an exemplary and great role model for everyone because of her nobility and her excellent character. So, continuing the light from last week, uh, from uh, the noble example of Khadija radiallahu anha, first and foremost, we should make our priority in any relationship to be with those who are the most noble. Nobility has different connotations. Nobility is not always uh, associated with lineage. Nobility is not always uh, associated with being descended from or part of royalty. Nobility is more than just your wealth or your status or saying that, you know, you're one percenter or first class this and, uh, you know, uh, high class that and I live in this neighborhood and my family is from this part of this country and so on and so forth. No. Nobility comes through adherence to the principles that Allah had set forth in Islam. And the more that a person adheres to those principles, the more noble they are because Islam grants nobility to the carrier of it. As Umar uh, Radulah, uh, he said, that uh, Islam is what gives us Izzah. Islam is what gives us honor. If we seek honor in anything other than Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will debase and humiliate us. So uh, whenever you are basing your relationships with any other people, there are many young people that I can see uh, in this call right now. I want you to make sure that uh, obviously when, when you uh, are looking for marriage and stuff like this, you need to look for people who are noble. And beyond, you know, that uh, journey of getting married and everything that comes with that, because we didn't want to make this series about uh, the mothers of the believers just merely, uh, you know, based on the topic of marriage, because this, this is a topic that gets discussed a lot and has a lot of commentary. Rather, even your friends, even the people that you choose to uh, put in your life, make sure that you are putting noble people there. And as one brother pointed out, Nabil means noble. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all the nobility. Allahumma amin. The second thing that we take from the light of Khadija radiallahu anha in this, in this portion of the, of the series is one body, one ummah. We know, that, we know this phrase, we understand this concept, that the body, uh, that the ummah is like a body. When one part of the body hurts, there's no way for us to, under, uh, to, to not feel it in the rest of the body. When, when you stub your toe or when you hurt your pinky or something happens to your hand, it's like uh, the mind cannot uh, rest or even think about any, uh, how everything else is working just fine and, and ignore the hand. Or ignore the toe. Um, 
it's one body and it's one ummah. So a testament of our love for one another as Muslim brothers and sisters, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many minority groups exist in the world. It doesn't matter how many uh, different people are being subjugated to uh, ill treatment. At the end of the day, as Muslims, the only ones that we have are each other because we have each other through connection that Allah said is even stronger than that of blood. And these are the bonds of Iman. These are the bonds of faith. So a testament of our love for one another is aiding and supporting each other, uh, even in the most difficult times. Sometimes as Muslims, we have this, you know, when it's good, it's good. You know, when, when, when everyone is doing good, then we're all in it together. Yay, you know, mashallah, we're, uh, look at how many of us come to our Eid. Man, they got this big uh, center. You know, we, we love going to Eid uh, all together at the at the uh, state fairgrounds in North Carolina. You know, you get everybody there. Obviously, with COVID, things going to be a lot different. I hear some of the are doing Eid in their cars through the radio. We ask Allah to make it easy. Allahumma. <laughs> but, you know, with COVID, things are different. Uh, just because we don't see each other doesn't mean that we don't support each other. Uh, one of the things that we were having a discussion with uh, with some of the brothers with on is uh, uh, you know the the some of the maxims or or the key principles of of the Sharia and and how one of its principles is to prevent harm, but also how masajid didn't really have a choice but to reopen because they know uh, because their donor population simply stopped donating. Just because you don't go to the house of Allah does not mean that it doesn't exist. Just because you are not uh, you know physically present at the masjid doesn't mean that it doesn't need your financial support. Support the masjid, one body, one ummah. We need to be willing to take care of each other. We need, uh, not just whenever I go to Juma will I drop money in the box. Let me go out of my way to actually go on the website and see how I can put something and contribute to make sure that the house of Allah is still there whenever COVID is not. You know, because the, uh, the dean was here before COVID and the dean will be here after COVID. So we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to support one another and the institutions of Islam, uh, regardless of COVID, regardless of if we see each other. You know, some of you may even feel like, especially some of the younger people or, you know, those who like to hit the dawah on the weekends and visit different families and things like that, you may feel like, uh, you know, man, once uh, I'm not really seeing my friends, I, I feel so sad that I'm not really seeing people like I used to. You know, just because we don't see each other doesn't mean we have plenty of means in order to get in touch with one another. SubhanAllah, we got all this technology on the face of the planet, if we can't uh, go out of our way to send a text message to each other, to send a phone call, to get on a Zoom uh, chat, uh, I'm pretty sure it's free uh, right now due to COVID. You can't, uh, you know, open up uh, Google Meets or anything just to see the face of your brothers and sisters and, and just to smile and extend to them. The support goes beyond when it's convenient. The, com the support goes beyond when it's easy. We need to also support each other in difficult times, just like Khadija radiallahu anha. She was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the business was booming, and she was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the Ummah was being oppressed and systematically targeted by the uh, institutions within their society. She was supporting, uh, you know, people before uh, the, the verses of, of Revelation came down. She's right there supporting them after, uh, you know, everything was going down. So we need to make sure that we also stay uh, aiding and supporting one another, even in the difficult times. That's when we should support each other the most. Another thing is more of a, of a qualitative trait that we as people should have all together, which is the more accommodating someone is, the more beloved they will be to those who have wilaya or closeness to them. Everyone loves the friend who says, hey, look, if you need me, I got you. Oh, you need help with something? Do you need to talk? Uh, oh, you need help moving this or you need help with that? People who are more beloved to, people, uh, to anyone else are the ones who are the most accommodating with their time, with their money, with their resources, with their knowledge, with anything that they can in order to help support someone else. Some of us have closeness to people, but we're stingy. We don't accommodate them. It's my way or the highway. Look, if you're not trying to talk about this, if you're not trying to watch that, if you're not trying to go here, if you're not trying to do it like that, if I, if I disagree with you even a little bit, then khalas, then, then I, I'm not gonna accommodate you. I'm not gonna go out of my way to do anything extra for you. What have you done for me lately? No. People who are loved the most by others are the ones who are the most accommodating to them. Uh, sometimes people, they wonder, you know, uh, I get into these issues. These people are struggle to make friends or I struggle with this, that, and the third. Ask yourself and be very, very honest, how accommodating are you? Because Khadija Raghilaranha, she, she did not, uh, when we say accommodating, we don't mean self-sacrificing. There's no concept in Islam of suffering and silence where I'm doing so much for you and I get nothing in return. In fact, I'm harming myself in order to give you everything I can. 
this is not a concept in the deen. In any form of relationship, Allah does not, Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they do not promote unhealthy relationships with people. And this is, uh, you know, sometimes we confuse the two, uh, the rights of marriage or the rights of the parents or the rights of the children or the rights of your friends or the rights of your community or the rights of the masjid or the rights of those in need. No, 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 no. This does not mean harm yourself, harm yourself. Now, sacrificing and being accommodating does not mean killing yourself in order to save someone else. This is not a concept in the deen. Rather, when we say accommodate, it means I do the most I can for you, not the most I want to for you. This is a big difference. And some of us, uh, we, can, we can do much more, but we don't want to. And, and this is a blameworthy characteristic. What we see in the, in the noble character of, of Khadija radiallahu anha is she went above and beyond. Everything that she could do, she did do. So we should also be the same way when it comes to each other. And there's a primary benefit that comes from being this way. The more accommodating you are of people, the more they will love you. And it's really, really simple. If you want people to like you more, if you want people to give you more slack, if you want people to give you the benefit of the doubt, if you want people to make concessions for you, then all you need to do is be accommodating. For example, if you are just chilling in your room all day and you haven't done anything, you could clean up, but you didn't, but you know, okay, your mom's going to get frustrated enough to eventually come in and pick these clothes up off the floor. She's going to nag me a little bit, but she's going to wash them anyways. No, 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 no. No, just be accommodating to yourself by being clean because this is a characteristic of the Muslim as the Prophet cleanliness is activated. So make sure you keep it tight and keep it clean anyways and not wait for somebody to come in and clean up after you, but go above and beyond. If you can do the dishes, then go do the dishes. If you can take out the trash, then go take out the trash. If you can go vacuum, then go vacuum. If you can dust, then dust. If you can straighten up, then you should. If you, could, if you can, then you should. This is what it means to be accommodating. And what do you lose by doing something good for someone else? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And these Aradilan had could have had any servant in her household or in her domain or within her, uh, you know, uh, resources to just take care of things. And, and you never even have to think about it. But she made it a point to make sure that if the Prophet Sallallahu was served something, it was served from her hand. It's just a little thing sometimes that make the biggest difference. And leave a legacy that extends beyond your life by being firm upon doing what Allah loves. The only way to leave a, a sound footprint on the earth, a physical footprint on the earth, is to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. There was a, a, you know, something happening recently where a, a famous da'i by the name of Muhammad Hijab uh, reached out to a, a famous person on YouTube by the name of Logan Paul and essentially you know, offered to talk to him about Islam. And Logan Paul seemed to be very receptive of it. And Muslims in our, uh, you know, knee-jerky reactionary type of way, everybody is getting very excited at the prospect of Logan Paul becoming a Muslim. And, oh, man, if he becomes a Muslim, man, no, 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 no. Someone who is popular is not what makes an impact. Someone who is well-known is not what makes an impact. Someone who today is trending is not what makes an impact. The only one that makes an impact is the one whom Allah chooses. The only one whom Allah chooses is the one whom he loves. And the only ones that he loves are the ones that go above and beyond. Saying all that to say... The legacy that will extend beyond your life is the legacy uh, that you put forward by adhering to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Doing anything less than that is not what's going to cause you to have an impact. Today you can have a million followers. When you die, what's going to happen to your account? It's just going to be deactivated. But today you can have a million subscribers. When you, when you die, what, what's going to be left from that? Rather, we seek a greater impact by doing what Allah loves. How is it that Imam al-Bukhari, Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari, with no social media, we quote him today as if he just died yesterday. In fact, we quote him and we say his name. How is it that uh, Imam al-Bukhari, most people don't even know his real name, his full name. Didn't even tell you. But oh, you know Bukhari. We say, we say Bukhari, Bukhari, like he just wrote the book and that it's a New York Times bestseller. And this was, uh, you know, some 11 centuries ago. This was uh, like 11 centuries ago. And we talk about his book like it just came off the presses. And when he wrote the book, they weren't even uh, printed and pressing it because it was all in the memory. <laughs> it was too expensive to even produce the full book. But it was narrated and dictated and preserved through uh, a memory for the most part until we made it to the age of printing and, and all of that becoming common. Saying all that to say, if you want to leave a legacy that extends beyond your life, like Khadija radiallahu anha did, then you need to make sure that you adhere to that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. She was known for being thahir. She was known for being pure. So make sure that you're pure. She was known for being noble. So make sure that you're noble. She was known for being intelligent. So act with intelligence. 
He was known for being accommodating, so make sure that you accommodate. And last but not least, the key to the love of others is expressly a truth through the love of Allah alone. Anything short of this is not true love. We know that the Prophet ﷺ, he really loved Khadija but the, the, the reason that he loved her anha, is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved her. When Allah loves someone, as we know in the Hadith Qudsi, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone, he tells Jibril. Jibril tells all of the inhabitants of heaven, all the inhabitants of heaven, they proclaim it, and then it even reaches the inhabitants of the earth to the point where everything between the dunya and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love, they love that person. And so you have no choice but to love them. Sometimes you see a person, you don't even agree with everything that they say. Sometimes you see a person, you don't really agree with their fashion sense or the way that they carry themselves and different things, but you can't hate them. In fact, in your heart, you just love them. And inshallah, this is a testament that Allah loves them. And uh, it's not just that the Prophet them loved her, but the Sahaba loved her. The Tabi'in, they loved her. The Tabi'in, tab they loved her. Even the other wives of the Prophet them, they loved her. And we love her as our first mother. And that love for her, radiallahu anha, will continue until the day of Deen and will extend until we meet her, inshallah ta'ala, uh, around uh, the river al Kawthar or, uh, you know, drink it from the uh, fountain of, of, of Salasabil. Uh, you know, in in fadas al ala bil ghairi hisab Allahumma amin. That love will, does not just stay here in this dunya. It does not just stay in a moment, but it extends into eternity. So, if you want true love, then make sure that you establish true love upon that which will last forever, forever. And the only way to do that is is through the love of Allah subhanahu wa taala, which is endless. And He is al wadud, the ever loving, the one who loves us more than we can even understand what the concept of love even means. So. Uh, ingratiate yourself by doing the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and uh, put yourself around people whom you love for his sake alone without party. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, additions, omissions, suggestions, or objections to anything that we shared today? I missed the last class, so I'd okay if this was mentioned, but do we need to love the wives of the Prophet and them equal to our birth moms or more? We should love the mothers of the believers. Um, it's not like the love that you have for your birth mom. When we say we love our, our mothers, it's not like saying that we love our mothers, may Allah have mercy on them. This is a different type of love. It's a, it's a love that's associated with belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet. It's a part of, as we, we as Muslims, we love the Sahaba. And a part of our love for the Sahaba is that we love the mothers of the believers. So we wouldn't say that that love is quite the same since, uh, you know, one love is. Uh, Okay, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we wouldn't say that, uh, you know, one love is, is the same as the other. Um, the reason why it's important for us to learn about the uh, the mothers of the believers is regardless of whether we're a the group, we can take from their uh, noble example. Just like how, uh, you know, even though I'm an African-American revert from Kentucky, I can I can take from the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though he lived, 1,440 years ago. I can still take from his example, even though, uh, you know, my, my mother tongue is English and his mother tongue was Arabic. I can still take from his example because he was the uh, person that Allah loved. And similar to that, the, uh, the Sahabiyat or the, the companions of the Prophet them who were women, these were amazing people whose examples not only we can take from, but we should take from like our mother Khadija, radiallahu uh, anha. And so we look at their examples in order for us to benefit from, uh, you know, seeing what great people are like, great people in the sight of Allah, so that we can be great. May Allah make you. Amen. When you mentioned it wasn't something normal when Khadija asked the Prophet them directly for marriage, were you referring to it not being normal at the time for women to approach a man directly for marriage or just a social class point? Both, actually. Um... So normally whenever, like if you, if you recall, whenever uh, in our last class we talked about how, um, uh, we talked about how uh, the, uh, after, after the husbands of Khadija Radulan had died, she, uh, people came and she, re she refused to accept them. But when she heard about the Prophet them and she observed him, then she went out of her way to extend the offer to him, and then his family came back and formally extended a, a formal offer to her, Radhi Anha. So at that time, this wasn't the norm, um, not just because of her status, but just because of the, the culture and the way that things were dealt with. And uh, 
yeah, it's not the norm today either. But through the example of Khadija Radhiwan, how we know that this is something that uh, in Islam, it's okay. I know sometimes, uh, you know, sisters, they feel like I have to wait for some man to come find me. You know, they feel like I have to wait for a man to come find me or for my parents to find me. You know, uh, have a healthy conversation with your parents when you're of age and at that point where you can have that discussion. And if there are people that you are interested in, be willing to put that forward to them because this is something that we see uh, from the example of Khadija Radhiwan. And it's actually something promoted uh, from the uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <clears throat> when you find someone with good character uh, and good deen that you're pleased with, then you should you should uh, make mention of it. And see how to go forward, inshallah. We ask Allah to allow for us to take from uh, the light of these noble examples and to impart it into our lives. We ask Allah to increase us in love for the Sahaba, in love for uh, those whom Allah had designated as the mother of the believers, so our mothers. We ask Allah to uh, increase us in Iman and thus increase us in love for them. And we ask Allah to uh, allow for us to maximize and benefit from these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Uh, we ask Allah to accept it from us, all of our ibadah. We ask him to accept it. We ask Allah to keep us safe from harm in all of its forms, to keep us safe from COVID and what is less than it and what is worse than it. And uh, affliction in all of its forms, financial, spiritual, emotional, and mental, and physical in all of its forms. And what is less than what we fear and what is more than we could even imagine in this life and the next. Allahumma ameen. Uh, Subhanakallahumma bihamdika sharamun la ilaha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.